Yeah, please, please do, Lee. Uh, I will press continue, otherwise I'll kick myself out. Okay, fantastic. Well, it's it's lovely to be here with you this morning. Um, I know many of you will probably sort of catch it up at various points. It's that one of those funny holidays where it's sort of part half term, part not half term for some people. So. Um, if you're watching the recording later on, then then hopefully um, it'll resonate just as much. But for those of you that are in the room, then, you know, I'm happy for you to sort of um, ask questions, uh, pop things in the chat. I'm sure Lee can offer them. Yeah, I'll keep an eye on the chat. We, we may have a little bit of time towards the end. But yeah, this is this is broadly about um, what has become, I guess, um, my absolute passion, uh, which is head teacher well-being, um, head teacher and leaders in particular. And I'm going to use I'm going to talk about head teachers and headship. But actually, you know, that's fairly interchangeable. I'm, I'm, I'm broadly talking about leaders in education. So they might be executive leaders in a trust. They might be a trust CEO. They might be, they might be sort of SLT members in a school. So um, I, I'm rather than saying head teachers and leaders all of the time, I will just say head teachers and you'll, you'll hopefully you'll get the gist. But um, I do this presentation um, as part of the work that I do for Heads Up for Head Teachers. Um, and it's, I'm, I've sort of adapted it ever so slightly for this morning um, to make it hopefully something which provokes some more thought and questions about the second header on that page, which is how can we create a system and a culture within our system where leaders can be the leaders they set out to be? Um, and I'll look at some of the issues that stop that from happening. So that's probably what we're going to cover. Um, I won't bother with that housekeeping slide, but yeah, today's aims, I, I really want to, uh, what we do at Heads Up is we celebrate headship. We don't just celebrate it, we also support head teachers and we campaign. So we tend to use those three words, celebrate, support and campaign on behalf of head teachers. Um, but I'm going to celebrate headship sort of whilst looking at the lens of my own headship and my own leadership. Um, and I tend to use the word crisis uh, and I use the crisis, the word crisis to describe I suppose what happened to me over the four years of my headship, um, but obviously that's become, that word crisis has become very significant over the course of the last two years during the pandemic. So um, it will be celebratory as lots of our heads up events are, but it's also looking at the darker side of what's going on. Um, and I'll also then talk about some of the practical strategies that have evolved through the work of Heads Up for Head Teachers that you know, may be useful to people on the call, may be useful to people watching the video afterwards, um, and um, we'll look at what those strategies are and, and the issues that those strategies are trying to adjust. Um, I always start my presentations with a thank you. Um, and that is, um, it's always a slightly risky thing to do to sort of thank a group of people that you've never really met before, but because uh, it, it might come across as being a little bit insincere, but um, I think it's really important. I don't think head teachers and leaders in schools get thanked anywhere near enough. Um, and they don't, get, they don't get thanked systematically. Um, you know, you don't often see the DFE sort of thanking leaders, I and mean, if they do, it often comes across as being a, bit, a little bit insincere. So, you know, I've got I've got four children in the education system, and and I've been a head teacher, and my wife is an assistant head teacher. You know, we know what it's like, um, and we know what it's like in normal times. So, I've gone out of my way in the last two years to spend time thanking the people who run our schools because it has been the most extraordinary effort by the most extraordinary group of people to ensure that education continues and you know again i sort of i'll talk about this a little bit later on but we are predisposed or we are driven to focus on the negative things aren't we the gaps that have been created and the loss of learning and the things that haven't happened and nobody really talks about the amazing learning that continued to happen and the brilliant education that continued during the pandemic and the leaders and the teachers and the staff in schools who made that happen um, and it's, it's a deep sense of frustration for me that we live and we exist in this deficit model. And I think that has an enormous impact on head teachers in particular, who tend to bear the brunt of all of those feedback loops from various different avenues. So as well as celebrating head teachers, we spend a lot of time thanking them because they have done the most extraordinary work. So hopefully that comes across as a, a sort of sincere thank you for everything that you've done and everything you will continue to do. Uh, over the course of how, however many years it is that you will be a head teacher and a leader in your community. Why am I here? Um, well, I'll do, the, I'll do the classic thing, which is the sort of, you know, the sort of high level superficial thing. Sort of Lee's sort of done a little bit of it already, but you know why I'm here? I'm James Pope. Uh, I'm a former head teacher, uh, executive head teacher in a primary school in a trust in the Southwest, uh, not a million miles away from where I am now. Um, and, you know, I am currently co-executive leader of Whole Education, which is a national network of schools and trusts. 
that work to create um, the schools that are really interested in creating sort of holistic education and the whole whole child approaches to school. Um, I have the joy of working with those schools uh, in a year, but I also am the director and founder of Inspire Educate. Um, and I started Inspire Educate when I stopped being a head teacher. And I started it with the notion of I can't be the only head teacher who feels like this. That was the starting point for creating Inspire Educate. Out of Inspire Educate grew heads up for head teachers. So that's the kind of why am I here? Um, but actually, I ask that question, and I ask, that, I ask this question of head teachers a lot when I'm doing launches for local authority areas or I'm working with trusts. Why are you here? Because I think it's a really fundamental and important question. So actually, there is a much more fundamental answer to that question. There's a much more sort of existential answer for that question, which is I'm here because I believe passionately in education and the power of education. And I believe passionately in making a difference for young people. And increasingly now, I believe passionately in making a difference for adults and indeed head teachers who work in our schools. So that's the thing, that's the connective purpose for me that's, that's driven, that's riven right the way through my career in education is where I get my energy and where I get my joy and where I get my sense of well-being comes from this notion of I am making a difference. And that making a difference for young people and adults and leaders who work in our schools is the thing that drives me on. And the reason why I make that point at this stage in this presentation is I think we've lost a little bit of our sense of purpose. And actually, when you ask people the question, why are you here? Why do you do the job that you do? It's a very powerful way and one that we use at Heads Up all of the time to reconnect people with their narrative, i.e. how they got here, but also actually what are you here to do? And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, <clears throat> and one of the reasons why I'm keen to make a difference for leaders is well, I'll, I'll work my way through these statements on the screen. Uh, headship is just the most amazing job. You know, leadership in schools or leadership of a trust or headship is just, you know, Vic Goddard says headship, the best job in the world. I, I sort of, I allocate that statement to Vic Goddard. I, I sometimes think several other people said it as well, including Ray Snape. Um, you know, headship, best job. No, I, that's exactly how I felt, both in my pursuit of a headship and during my headship, even though it was very, very difficult. I always viewed it as being the most amazing job in the world. And I felt very, very privileged to be in that position. And I think that's part of, again, part of the consequence of the pejorative or negative deficit environment in which we operate. We can lose sight of that. That actually we have the privilege every single day of doing the second thing, which is inspiring young people and inspiring adults. And we've all been inspired. We wouldn't be sat here today if we hadn't had people who had inspired us during our lifetimes. You know, my, my own journey from school was a rocky one, to say the least. Um, you know, and, and, but I still vividly remember, and let's face it, pretty much everybody does vividly remember that one teacher who made a difference for them. And for some people, it'd be more than one teacher. It'd be a whole group of teachers. But for me, it was a teacher who went out of her way to make sure that I could do GCSE biology. When it didn't fit in my timetable, she taught it to me at a lunchtime at school and after school at her house. It was the 1980s. You could get away with that kind of stuff then. You couldn't do it now. But, you know, in the 1980s, you get away with it. She totally inspired me. So to be inspired is great. You, we would hope that all of our young people and indeed as leaders, the staff that we're working with are inspired by us at some point. But to inspire others and to, have, to be in the privileged position to have the opportunity to inspire others every single day is incredible. And for me, that's where, that's what makes Headship the best job in the world. You know, you get up every single morning and walk into school. And no matter what else is going on, you are likely during the course of that 24 hours to inspire somebody. Of course, they're not, they're not going to run up to you high-fiving you and go, yeah, you inspired me. That very rarely happens. That's one of the problems for head teachers. We very, we very rarely get that positive feedback. Okay, but to know that it's going on and then to go and seek those opportunities where it's happening to provide and to create our own positive feedback loop, for me, is one of the routes to well-being for head teachers, and I'll touch upon that later on. And, you know, all of that builds really into this notion of the joy of headship. And but then in, in talking about the joy of headship, in celebrating the joy of headship, in celebrating headship, recognizing that actually, have we lost sight of that a little bit? 
Have we forgotten that is the best job in the world? Have we forgotten that we get the privilege of inspiring people every single day? Have we forgotten that it is a joyful job? Okay, and I'm asking these questions, you know, you know, really sort of honestly, and oh, let's just decline that call and hopefully I'll come back to you. There's always a risk when that happens, sorry. I'm back, uh, that was smoothly done, wasn't it? Um, so, you know, I think, I think it's really important that we don't forget those things, but we reflect on actually that feeling, actually, why am I here? You know, what was my purpose? When I became a head teacher, what was my purpose? What was my journey? So the joy of headship, um, and I love this, I love this graph because that's what I went into. When I became a head, it was the first thing that I had proactively and actively worked towards in my entire career. I described myself as an accidental teacher. I accidentally became a teacher. I didn't set out to do it. I was classically one of those people that came out of university, had my degree in my hand. I was like, yes, there's my, there's my applied biology degree. Um, I moved back down to Gloucestershire. I ended up working in a car breaker's yard for two years, uh, taking cars apart. Um, I don't even know whether that's an activity that happens anymore. I guess they'd call it recycling. But back then, we used to strip the bits off. I knew nothing about cars. I don't know how I got the job, but I did. But after about a year, I recognized that perhaps it wasn't, it wasn't the best use of an applied biology degree. So um, I accidentally became a teacher. I went, what should I do? I looked around at jobs. None of them really took me. Um, and I thought, okay, I'll become a teacher. That was the start of my journey. I, and that was, I was, again, that making a difference. I still vividly remember the moment where I recognized teaching as something where you can make a difference. It was as I delivered my first it took me three weeks to prepare it. I was given three weeks to prepare it. My first 20 minute teaching segment to a group of year nines at Cleve School in Gloucestershire. Um, uh, I was incredibly nervous. They were incredibly gracious. There were only about seven of them. Um, but I had that moment, that, you know, that moment that teachers get every now and then where I was teaching something and, and I recognized it for what it was was the moment where a child, the penny dropped on the thing that I was teaching. As a, it was a practical demonstration. And, and that's it, making a difference. Oh my God, I can use my knowledge of this subject to make a difference for these young people. And that was the start of my journey, but it was accidental. My journey into headship was deliberate and purposeful. I deliberately set out to become a head teacher because I recognized that if I can make a difference in my own classroom for a group of children, I can make a bigger difference for more children as a leader in school. So I set out deliberately on this journey. The real journey, I set out with joy. I set out with this notion of awesome, let's do this. I, I became a head teacher of Marwood School in South Gloucestershire. There I am. Um, that's the, you can see the joy on my face, can't you? There you are, I've got the job. Uh, I'm full of joy. Uh, if you look really closely into my eyes, you can also see the fear. Uh, that everybody experiences and I, 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 I absolutely challenge anybody who sat on this call who has been a head teacher or is currently a head teacher uh, not to recognize that that moment uh, I still remember vividly being in my kitchen as I got the call from the trust that was running the recruitment process for me to become the head teacher of my old school to be told we'd like you to offer you the job uh, and me saying yes I'd definitely like to take it thank you very much and just being filled with this sense of joy and optimism and then about 10 minutes after I'd put the phone down, sitting there going, oh my God, what have I done? Because we've all been there, okay? And that's one of the things that's really interesting when we're looking at head teacher well-being is the, again, a little bit of a dichotomy of the confidence to step into the space in the first place and the lack of self-confidence, which makes you doubt yourself throughout the time in which you are a leader. And we'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later on. So if you look, you can see both of those things in my eyes. That was the publicity shot. Uh, the classic publicity shot for uh, welcome to Marwood School and you had teacher going in the local newspapers. If I knew now what I knew then, I often ask myself this question, would I have gone for the job? <laughs> and, and I'm not sure because actually, yes, you set out with joy. Yes, you set out with optimism. Yes, you set out with purpose and thinking that you're doing the best job in the world and you're going to inspire people. But let's face it, it's not a smooth journey. So when we look at the actual graph for the real journey, uh, this is this is kind of what it looks like. Awesome. Let's do this. OK, that's me. The beginning of September 2014. Great. Become a head teacher. Absolutely fantastic. I got over my initial nerves after the first 10 minutes. Oh, God, this is hard. This is really hard. OK, and, and what's interesting about this graph, I mean, I use it to describe my own journey on some of the presentations I do, my own journey. And, and I won't go into the detail of it. You can you probably read about it, to be quite honest. But 
it was, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the four intense years it was. What's interesting for heads is this can actually describe an hour, this graph. And you know, if you have been ahead or you are ahead, you know, you know what it's like, right? That time frame at the bottom can be an hour. Oh, God, this is really difficult. Oh, yeah, brilliant. I've resolved it. Oh, no, it's gone wrong again. This roller coaster of energy. And it's the energy roller coaster that we describe all of the time that heads up for head teachers and how you manage the energy roller coaster. Uh, but you hope that over time, that, you know, your joy, your joy cup is filling up over time, right? So it, even though in that hour, you hope you're going to end the hour more joyful than you were at the beginning of it. The time frame could be a week. It could be a term. It could be a whole academic year. It could be four years. I use this graph to describe my four years in headship. Okay, and the, uh, this is hard moment for me. It wasn't a pandemic. I've got absolutely no comprehension of what it must have been like to leave our schools through the last two years. Because I've never led you in a pandemic. I don't know. I suspect it's been, oh, this is really hard. And an awful lot of ouch and rough and uh-oh moments. But I absolutely guarantee that even during that pandemic, there have been. And if there haven't, it's because we have neglected to look for them. Lots of yes and nice ones and brilliant. And this is great moments. And this is my point about always focusing on the deficit of what's missing in education. Okay, I'm not spending our time looking at the impact of what we've done. But for me, the oh, this is hard moment. I've been at the school for three weeks. I was preparing for my first governor's meeting. Uh, that, was, that was an interesting moment in itself. It was about seven hours long, started about seven o'clock in the evening and finished about two o'clock in the morning. Uh, apparently that was a tradition of governor's meetings. I am exaggerating, but not by much. Uh, but my oh, this is hard moment was preparing the finances and realizing that the finances that I looked at when I interviewed which demonstrated a beautiful balanced set of books. In fact, they, they indicated uh, that there was, a, there was a small but not insignificant amount of money in the bank for me to play with. Uh, when it came to me actually going through the finances in fine detail, I discovered that uh, the small but not insignificant amount of money that was in the bank, A, wasn't in the bank, uh, according to the local authority, and B, had been used to balance the books. So I was staring at an in-year deficit of £500,000 before I'd even started. So I had to save half a million pounds uh, before the following July, so in-year. So that was, my, that was my first, oh, this is hard moment. Um, I also realised that having done that calculation, that that meant for the following September, I had to save £700,000 because we had a falling role. That was to do with local area demographics that nobody had done anything about. So basically, in the space of a year, I had to save £1.2 million. Quid. Uh, off a 5.4 million pound income. So that was, my, that was my crisis. And it was a crisis. You know, I was on the back foot. Nobody, no MPQH prepares you for that, right? And this is the interest, I'm using my example. There'll be thousands of other head teachers who've got their own story, their own, oh, this is hard, that an MPQH is never going to prepare you for. Okay, so brilliant. You're ready to be a head teacher. Fantastic. Okay, by the way, you've got to save 1.2 million pounds. It got worse. And the next year I had to save another 600. The next year, basically, by the time I finished, four years later, I set a, I set a budget based on an income of 2.8 million pounds. So I had to save 2.6 million pounds in the space of just over three and a half years. That was hard. Okay, what's interesting though is it was hard and the TV program demonstrated exactly how hard it was because it painted a very depressing picture. But I'm always keen to point out to people that even in my final year, when I really had mentally and physically, I was just done. I was completely done. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Even during that last year, there were lots of yay and nice one and champagne and yes moments. And I think we must always hold on to that because it's easy to paint this picture of education as this negative thing. And it's not. It's absolutely awesome and brilliant. And we must recognize as leaders that we are the guardians of that. We are the ones who sell that. Vic Goddard would say, you know, we bring the weather in our schools. We create the weather in our schools, but we do it in our community. But most important that collectively, which is the aim of Heads Up for Head Teachers, we do it for education. As head teachers, the DFE are not going to paint a rosy picture of education. It's not in their best interest to. Neither are Ofsted. Those two organizations are going to go out of their way to do the opposite. So actually, who's painting the rosy picture? And actually, if we don't do it as leaders collectively, 24,000 of us in England, 24,000 head teachers, if we stood up and collectively painted the positive impact and picture of education, 
then we could start to change, I think, the mindset and culture that exists in our schools for our young people. And I think, I think that's a really important point. But <clears throat> I digress a little bit. I'll come back on, I'll pick up on some of those things a little bit later on. But so that was my journey. It was horrendous. And I recognized, you know, my moments, which still now I'm going to tell this story and it still makes me tear up a little bit and choke when I tell it. It was, I was, it was about this time of year. It was 2018. So it is now four years ago, which I can barely and scarcely believe. I was driving to my school. It was after February half term, so it was in March. Um, and I, uh, the song came on. I, this, this presentation is normally titled Where's Your Head At? And the reason why it's titled that is because the song that came on the radio was Where's Your Head At by Basement Jacks. And if you know that song, I've now introduced an earworm into your head, which will be there for the rest of the day. Okay, so Where's Your Head At? And I was thinking, I basically, so when I started my headship, my first ever presentation to the staff was, if we stop enjoying it, we should stop doing it. And I sat in the car and I recognized that I'd stopped enjoying it. The joy for me had been sucked out of it by the finance, by what Ofsted did to my school. The joy had completely gone. And in that moment, listening to that song, tears streaming down my face, I recognized that physically and mentally I was done. The system had completely sucked everything out of me. And I recognized that the, the only thing I could do was resign. And that's when I resigned. In that moment, driving to school, I made the decision that I was no longer the right person to leave that school. It was brutal. And the whole point of Heads Up for Head Teachers is it shouldn't be like that. We should not be treating our leaders. And I'm not the only one. You know, since then, I've received phone calls. I literally deal with, we offer crisis coaching as part of Heads Up. So basically, if you're a head teacher, and you are really struggling, pick up the phone and give us a call and we will talk to you. I've done hundreds of those calls in the last three years, pre-pandemic as well. It's not just about the pandemic, but we shouldn't be treating our heads like that. So that, that was my story and that's why I'm here doing what I do uh, today. What did I learn? Well, I learned the resilience. I was, look, I painted myself as you, I was your typical superhero. Yeah, I can do, you do 18 hours a day, I do 18 and a half, right? That kind of culture. I was, I was one of them. You know, but I, what I learned in that moment is my resilience well was completely dry. And, and it's really important that we acknowledge that resilience is great. I hate the way we use the word resilience in education, by the way. I hate the way it's been used against us. Are you a resilient leader? Of course you are. You don't get to become a head teacher unless you're resilient. How the heck do you think you ever become, or a leader, you're a deputy head or whatever it is. Of course we're resilient. That's not the point. The point is that everybody has a limit. And what I'm, what I'm really campaigning for with Heads Up in the work that we do with the, with the unions and with the NGA and with the DFE, with organizations like your own is, can we stop taking this kind of sink or swim approach to headship? Let's find out where your resilience lies. Let's find out when your resilience well empties. We're gonna take you right to the edge. We're gonna break you. Can we stop doing that? Can we actually put some support in place that stops people feeling like that? Because that's how I felt. So I learned that my resilience well was finite. It's not infinite. You can't just keep going back to it. You have to do something about it. And, you know, I'll give you a demonstration of resilience um, and, and some stats that back it up. So, because um, I just, I find it a really interesting um, a concept. So, Teacher Tap, many of you will know Teacher Tap, Teacher Tap survey, uh, uh, basically once a month, they survey teachers on their sense of um, well being, on their stress and anxiety levels. And um, forehead, they can extrapolate, they can, they can extract from the data which ones are head teachers. And when they do that extraction, what they find, you can see this on their website, but what they found pre pandemic every month, they tend to find about 86% of head teachers are saying that they're operating with acceptable levels of stress and anxiety. That's a demonstration of how resilient our head teachers are. When you, when you look at what head teachers are actually doing on a daily basis, the fact that 86% of them say, yeah, I'm fine, I'm all right. I'm okay. However, you sort of think, well, okay, 86%, that sounds really good. That means 14% of them are not. 14% doesn't sound like a lot, but 14% of 24,000 is 3,600 head teachers every month are operating with undue levels of stress and anxiety. And there is very little in the system which is there to systematically support them. Now, if you look at that teacher tap survey through the last two years, you will not be massively surprised to learn there have been some huge spikes in that data during the last two years. There have been moments when nearly 50% of our head teachers, of our school leaders have said, I can't deal with this. My stress and anxiety levels are through the roof. That's half of them, that's 12,000 head teachers. 
So as well as celebrating headship, and this is where it gets really tricky for us, but as well as celebrating it, if we're going to support it, we have to acknowledge the roller coaster. We have to acknowledge the joy over time graph. We have to acknowledge that we can't just sit here with a big smile on our faces, go, yeah, it's the greatest, joke. it's the best job in the world. Yes, it is. And yes, it can be. But sometimes it's not okay. And we have to create a culture for our head teachers. If we're not going to have this, let's take them to the edge and break them, or this sink or swim approach, we have to create a culture where it's okay to say, it's not okay. I'm not okay. I needed to be able to say in my job to the people around me, of which I was supported by very many, very supportive people, I need to be able to say, I'm not okay at the moment. This is really, really making me struggle. And I couldn't because of the culture that exists in our system. I was not, and that's what we want to change at Heads Up for our teachers. We want to create a space where it's okay for heads to go. I'm not okay, actually, and I need some support. What else did I learn? Well, I learned that we all begin our headship like this, right? So there's the road ahead of us. We're pretty confident people have said, you don't become a head if you're not confident and resilient on all of those big words, you know, confidence, resilience. Um, you know, you set off with an aim, right? You've got, I set off with a goal in mind. I knew exactly what I wanted to do with Marwood School. It was built on values. It was built on educational principles. It was built on a notion of what I'd, you know, what I, what I developed over 20 years of being, this is what education should be. Then it won't be a surprise that the values that I had align very much with the cooperative schools movement and the cooperative schools network and whole education. You know, all of those organizations that have this shared view and vision of what an education for young people could be. That was, that was the road I was on. That's what I was doing. But one of the other things that we, we therefore have recognized at Heads Up and therefore we take on board at Heads Up is Yes, we set out to be that leader. That was the leader that I set out to be. That was me at the beginning of the journey. And that was the road. I was absolutely crystal clear on it. And of course, I knew I'd have to adapt it to the context of my school. But I knew what the end of the journey looked like. I knew where I was aiming for. At the end of four years, that's what it felt like. And this is, how, this is what we use to describe. And this is, this is where we start to get into a well-being space. Because actually, this is what I described my problem as being. And this is what resonates with thousands of leaders in the Heads Up Network, is that the road gets split. And there's the leader that we set out to be, wanting to do the things that we set out to do on behalf of young people in our schools. And then there's the leader that the system wants us to be. Yeah. And it diverges. Yeah, it's done. And you've got this, these are the values that this is, I led here, and that's where most leaders lead. They lead from their heart and the fire in their belly. And of course, they've got all of the technical experience and skills up here, of course they have. You don't get to get the job unless you've got those. But they're also leading from here. And we set out on this journey of this, and maybe I was naive, right? Maybe we're all naive, but I set out with this view of this is the school that I can create. And I'm now the head teacher. So I've now got the grace to do it. I've worked hard to reach this position. But you then realize very quickly that the system doesn't want you to do those things. The system wants you to do these things over here. And what's important about that divergence is it's the values of self versus the values of the system. And that's where you start to see a huge well-being problem. Because it's when we get detached from our values or when our values get bent out of shape that we start to develop this sense of uh, unease and anxiety and stress comes from this point of I'm not I'm not doing the thing that I set out to do I'm doing this other thing instead so that's really at the crux of what we do at heads up for head teachers so we believe that there's loads of superficial things you can do for well-being right and I'm not criticizing any of these things but you know you can do things like um, put on well-being classes and yoga and all that you know all of that sort of stuff and it all is super but actually you know it's like the icing on the cake that unless the cake's solid and the solid bit of the cake for us is we have to reconnect our leaders with their purpose, with their sense of values. And part of that, the campaigning end of it then, is we have to wrestle back the leadership of our education system. There's no point looking to Ofsted or the DfE for you know, leadership about where the direction of travel for education is. We have to create that ourselves. And when we do that work, we do that work at scale, but actually we do that work with each individual leader that we engage with. And when we do it, every single time the leader will come out of that process and go, oh my God, I feel so much better about my job. 
And so purpose and well-being for us are absolutely stitched together. And this is what I'm going to go on to talk about. So, you know, practical strategies for support. Hopefully these will be useful. I'm going to whiz through them, um, but I'll talk about how, you know, if you, if you are interested in them. So that's the kind of celebrating headship, but recognizing its darker side. And we have to recognize the darker side. We can't just walk around pretending that everybody's wonderful all the time. And by the way, if you're listening to this and actually you're a new head teacher or actually your headship's just going really well, big thumbs up. I'm really, really, you know, it's not that, you know, we should be going, yes, fantastic, that's great. But we should also recognize that for some people it doesn't feel like that. Okay, so what do we do about it? So identifying practical strategies. So what we do at Heads Up for Head Teachers is we try to reconnect people with the joy of headship. We try to remind people of this is why you do the job that you do. That's just a small representation of our community. Many of those people are on our um, advisory group um, because they are committed. They were there at the very beginning of the journey three years ago when I started Heads Up for Head Teachers. Um, you know, and that's you, you, some of you will recognize Patrick Offley O'Connor on there. I heard some of you use the term put your own oxygen mask on first, you know, earlier on. And Patrick used that a lot on social media. You know, and is a big well-being champion, but you'll, you know, you may recognize some other people on that screen as well. But that's at the core of what we do is can we help people to get back to through these practical strategies? Can we help them get back to this notion of the joy of headship? And by the way, many people on that screen are former head teachers. And these are people, I won't name who they are, but there are at least six of them on that screen who, alongside me, will say, and they they because they've been they joined Heads Up because they sought it out for support initially. And then, you know, which was when it was me, and then they started to join Heads Up as they, as they, and they start to support other people. And many of them will say that if they've had something like Heads Up for Head Teachers when they were a head teacher and they were in the dark times, they would probably still be a head teacher. So, you know, that's, this, this is the kind of, this is kind of, the kind of community that we're trying to create. Now what, so what are our heads saying? Look, we, we're now a community of some 5,000, actually 6,000 plus as of the weekend members. Uh, we work actively with about 1,500 head teachers, um, i.e., we are actively supporting about 1,500 head teachers. But these are the things that they say. These are the commonality, and I've already touched on a lot of them. I'm not going to spend ages talking about them. They will resonate with you if you're listening. Okay, so the bizarre isolation of being a head teacher, being surrounded by people every single day, and yet feeling very lonely sometimes. Um, you know, even when you're in a room full of people, you can feel that loneliness, that notion of um, isolation that just comes with the responsibility of the job. Uh, the imposter syndrome is always one that makes people smile. You know, <laughs> how did I get this job? Uh, how, what, can I still do it? The self-doubt, that point about self-doubt and self-confidence. Um, you know, we, we twist that, we stick that on his head at Heads Up. We turn around and say, actually, the imposter syndrome is really important because if you've got it, you're probably A, a vulnerable leader, and being a vulnerable leader, you're probably much more human. You know, the, the, the danger comes when actually we forget the imposter syndrome. We start to think we're brilliant at everything all of the time. And, and we see those people put on pedestals in our education system, don't we? You often see a lot of them uh, in, in the news and in the newspapers and indeed on social media being presented to us as these, well, I have no faults. I, I have no vulnerability. I am the perfect leader. It's a nonsense. Uh, the competition that's been created in our culture. So the bizarre situation where schools that are down the road from each other, both trying to do brilliant things for their young people, being led by brilliant people, end up being in competition with each other. Lots of head teachers talk about that. And, and how unsettling that is, that we should be collectively collaborating with each other. And instead, there's this little niggling undercurrent of competition. Those first three things are nearly always driven by the fourth thing that people will talk about, which is the high stakes accountability system. Uh, many people will tie those four things together. And they will say to us, they will talk to how our head teachers will talk to us about the impact that those things have on their relationships and their sense of well-being and their health. So the, the knock-on impacts of those things. Of course, uh, that normal times, right? Those are the things that head teachers uh, have to deal with. That's it. It comes with a job. And then you stick a pandemic over the top of it and it just amplifies everything. It's amplified everything. You know, this feeling of isolation. God, there's nobody to tell me, you know, the guidance in the, remember the guidance in the early days, the pants guidance coming out of the DFE. Nobody's telling me what to do. I've got, I've got the imposter syndrome amplified beyond belief because let's face it, nobody, nobody trains you during your MPQH to be um, a pandemic uh, wielding ninja who knew exactly what to do with your community. So of course you have this sense of it. So all of those things are exaggerated during the pandemic. And I take us back to the road. And what the pandemic did is it added to, so as well as the system driving this wedge between the leader that we set out to be and the leader that the system wants us to be, the pandemic created this further split in our straight road. So many 
when we're talking about well-being, this is where we think our well-being strategies in schools for young people have to be much deeper as well, and for teachers in our schools have to be much deeper. We have to recognise that all of those people in our communities have lost their identity and their sense of purpose. You know, children didn't expect to go to schools during a pandemic when they would, their, their classes would get closed at a moment's notice and they'd have to switch to online learning. So our young people have lost their sense of purpose about their education. GCSE is being taken away. God, I would be campaigning for that all day long, but we must appreciate the knock-on impact that had for children who've been told nothing else for five years than your education is all about your GCSE. They've had their purpose stripped away. And the same for staff in our schools. So is it any wonder that when the road isn't straight like this, that people start to feel unsettled and their well-being is attacked? Well-being and purpose intrinsically linked. So this is, these are the approaches we take at Heads Up, okay? So we, are, we, we underpin what we do with this sort of notion of uh, positive psychology. And this is, positive psychology reinvents post-traumatic stress disorder into post-traumatic growth because you can view it in two, through two different lenses, right? So how do we respond to adversity and trauma? How did I respond to adversity and trauma? Uh, how do we respond? The, the adverse event is where the graph goes vertical. So you've got your level of functioning, which is horizontal, then an adverse event happens, bang. Okay, and, and let's face it, it, as heads, that can happen at any moment. The adverse event could be an offset, it could be a bad set of data, it could be a safeguarding issue in your school, it could be one of your communities complained about you. It happens all of the time. We're dealing with these things all the time. Some of them are big and some of them are little, but we're on this roller coaster of energy all of the time. And what we're interested in as a heads up is what strategies can we employ to make sure that when people reach the bottom of that vertical line and they start to respond, that the response is thriving and recovering, not surviving with impairment and succumbing, okay? uh, which is where the post-traumatic stress sits. So how can we help our leaders to respond every time. What's interesting about the pandemic is we've had this collective traumatic event, adverse event. We've all experienced it at the same time and people are recovering in different ways. So actually, what do we do about that? Well, at Heads Up, we talk about intentional support for head teachers. It's amazing how intentional we are for everybody else in education, but not for heads and leaders. So our view is we should be as intentional in putting support in place for heads. At that point, to make sure that they recover and thrive as we are for everybody else. And when we say that, we recognize that heads are sometimes their own worst enemy because they'll look after everybody else first and themselves last. What we're saying is, okay, make sure that you're doing your bit for yourself and we can help you with that. Heads up fair teachers, we can support you with that. But the other thing in terms of the cultural shift is we have to recognize that intentional support should not only be used at the point at which we are worried about somebody. It shouldn't just be used when we're worried about ourselves. We should be using it here to keep people in that space so that support, um, coaching, mentoring, supervision for head teachers becomes part of the norm of our system. So we recognize that it is a challenging job. It is the best job in the world, but it is also challenging. We recognize that it is, and we intentionally put things in from the beginning. So we work with the National Governors Association. How can we help your chair of governors to ask the question of their new head teacher, which is what support do you want rather than um, is there support that we can offer you? So that actually it becomes intentional and proactive. These are the supports that we have. Which one do you want to access first? It's very different. Do you need any support? You've just recruited a head teacher and you ask them that question. They're going to turn around and go, no, I'm fine, because they're proving themselves. They're in that proving space. Whereas actually if governors change the question or employers change the question, we can be a bit more intentional. And if we do all of that, and, if, and this is what we do, it heads up, if we do all of that, then we, we, we do this. So this is the first of two sort of Japanese philosophies that we use at Heads Up called Kintsukurai. And it's this notion that actually, yeah, do you know what? Headship can be hard and it can be challenging and it can create little hairline cracks. But actually, if we're there and ready with the intentional support, if we're there and ready with the gold lacquer or the silver lacquer, then actually what we will have is tougher, harder, more resilient and more beautiful and more vulnerable leaders who are able to do the job that their communities need them to do and to do it really, really well. So we employ this notion of kin sakurai and actually helping people, not just leaving them to suffer on their own, but helping people to, to go through this recovery and in doing the recovery, going through this process of transformation. I'm going to whisk through these nine steps. So I'm just really conscious of the time, but this, you know, this is what we do. 
So if you if you join a heads up session or you take part in a heads up program, this is not what is on the. So these these are the things that we tackle. So uh, helping head teachers to be honest with themselves. How are you? We ask that how are you question and we mean it. How often do we ask that question or get asked that question every day? We can take you. We can talk to you about how are you for a whole hour, you know, with a group of leaders. How are you? Genuinely, how are you? And actually, we will make it safe and okay for you to turn around and go. Actually, you know, I thought I was okay, but I'm not. Okay, so that's the first thing. So it's about being honest. With, how are you? Genuinely, okay? Because of course, we have to put the we, what we call the cloak of invincibility or our superhero clothes, whatever you want to call it. We have to put those on to lead our community, but we also have to have a space where it's okay to say, actually, I'm going to take that cloak off. God, it's been a hard week. I've had a really tough week. It should be okay to do that. That's the first thing. Second thing, recognize that all of the time. This is really simple for us. If you get the head's head right, the rest of the organization has a much better chance of being successful. Okay, so if recognize the need, we need head teachers to go, it's important, and we need their employers, trusts, and governors to go. It's important that we look after our lead professional. If we don't, then actually that's going to create much bigger problems. So self-care isn't selfish. You can't pour from an empty cup. Identify the barriers. I mean, this isn't rocket science. What are the barriers? What's making it difficult for me to, um, to achieve self-care and to look after myself? Uh, well, it's nearly always time. And, and then the second one is nearly always time. And then the third one is nearly always time. And the fourth one's nearly, it's just time, right? So we help people to look at what they're doing in a week and create time to look after themselves. So we support them with that. We spend a lot of time talking about actually, if it's a joyful job, why not spend a bit of time looking at the things that bring you joy? Actually go out into your community, the one that you lead and you've created and look for the things that bring you joy because those things will make you feel happier. And if you feel happier, you'll have a greater sense of well-being. So what do you currently do to look after yourself? You know, what do you currently do? If you like, one of our head teachers that we work with, she loves to sing. So, okay, go and sing with your children once a week. So she now does that every week. She goes and joins in with a class at singing. And she said it just, it's the best moment in a week. She does that thing and it's amazing. It could be cycling, it could be running, it could be going for a walk with your dog. But actually, do you create the time and do you do more of those things? And do you focus in those things? And we help people to do that. Build a positive self-image. Okay, one of the consequences of the imposter syndrome, but also the negative system in which we operate, is it's really hard for head teachers to be positive about themselves. Let's face it, you know, you, you, you might get the best set of results in the world in the summer, whether you're a secondary school or a primary school, you get an amazing set of results. What do you spend the next nine months of your life focused on? The results that didn't work, the children for whom it didn't work. So we spend all of our time thinking that we're rubbish. Actually, we're not. 80 to 90% of what happens in our schools on a, on a daily basis is brilliant. You know, it's half term for some schools at the moment. For all those schools that are at school, children are having the most amazing education. So let's build a positive image about education, but let's build a positive self-image. So uh, we help people to do that. Part of that is focusing on your impact and facing yourself down. Get out into your school and look at the brilliant things that you have done. That's what we talk to our head teachers about. When do you walk around your school with no other reason? You're not looking at us from a staff point of view. Okay, you're not walking around looking for all of the things that are wrong. Okay, all of the evidence that you want to give to. We reconnect people. That, why did you become a head? Why are you here? Okay, and when we get people to focus on their impact and go and do that activity, it's amazing because what they do is they start to focus on um, the skills and knowledge and experience that they're bringing to the role that creating that culture in their school where children have got big smiles on their faces like that last picture. And this helps to start to deal with the imposter syndrome. Actually, I am doing a good job. Okay, Ofsted might be looking at this globally, but actually for those individual children, I am doing a good job, which starts to help us reconnect with our purpose. What's your why? And this is our second Japanese philosophy, Ikigai. What's your why, your reason for being? When I talked to heads about why they became head teachers, I talked a little bit about why I became a head teacher earlier on. I asked you the question, why are you here earlier on? For those of you who are head teachers, I very rarely get the response, oh, I really wanted to improve the Progress 8 school in my school. Or I was worried about phonics in Key Stage 1. Or I wanted to bet SATs results in Key Stage 2. When you ask people, why do you do the job that they do? They really always talk about making a difference for young people. They talk about their community. They talk about humans. 
And part of what we do at Heads Up is reminding people that we are a human industry. We deal in human beings. And therefore, as leaders, we have to tap into our own humanity. Uh, on a separate talk, it's a completely different talk, this, but I often talk about the things that have happened in education over the last decade to dehumanize it, to turn it into a set of data, to turn our children into, into data points rather than human beings. Because actually, the part of the problem is human beings are complex. And if we have to deal with them as human beings, we have to deal with complex systems. And the DfE don't want to do that. Ofsted don't want to do that. They want to deal with simplicity. They don't want complex. They don't want complex. They're not interested. What's the best way of doing it? Dehumanize it. We, we say, no, let's not do that. Let's get people to reconnect with their purpose. Let's get people to ask the question, what's education for? What are schools for? These big questions that leaders and head teachers should be really focused on. So what's your why? That's it. Um, so through the Ikigai framework, we've, I've already, if you, if you recognize it from the previous steps, okay, what are you good at? Okay, what, who are you inspiring and how are you inspiring them? What you love doing and what your community needs from you. Those are the underpinnings for the nine steps. Okay, so step eight is helping people to reconnect with their purpose. And then step nine, we love this Brennan Brown quote, okay, connection. We talked about energy roller coaster earlier on, and it's amazing because we're isolated, we spend our time on that energy roller coaster on our own. Actually, it wouldn't be better if we were on that energy roller coaster with a load of other head teachers who got it, or a load of other leaders who got it. So actually, rather than being isolated, and that's kind of the, the crux of what we're doing at Heads Up, is creating a community of people with shared values and a shared humanity and a shared vulnerability so that we can connect together because other head teachers get it. Imposter syndrome, bizarre. You sit around a table at a, a, local, a local authority strategy meeting, looking at other head teachers going, oh my God, they're so much better than I am. And, you know, my, my imposter syndrome is doing this in my ear like this. Do, 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 do. Okay, those head teachers are looking at you thinking exactly the same thing at exactly the same time, but we never talk to each other about it. And so consequently, we all leave that meeting thinking we're the worst head teacher in the world, when actually we're all doing a brilliant job. So when we connect and we create a community where we've seen heard and valued and we're seen and it's not judgmental there's very few spaces in education for head teachers that are like that there's always a judgment we're often not seen or heard or valued that's why we don't get thanked so that's what we're trying to create a heads up just a bit just to finish off just a bit of specifics about what we do for those of you that are interested and want to know a little bit more um, so uh, everything on this page, apart from the LA support at the bottom, is free. So we do what we do. Um, basically, I, I do a load of work elsewhere uh, through Inspired Educate, and basically we fund the network through that. So bi-weekly peer support sessions, Wednesday evening and Saturday mornings, uh, where we really bring head teachers together and we create this community of support. You, you can come and join those. Uh, we do fortnightly peer coaching versions of those for deputy head teachers and assistant head teachers on a Saturday. So if you've got people in your team who are interested, they can come and join. Crisis coaching, if you are struggling, please do not do what I did and struggle alone. Okay, pick up the phone. We, somebody will have a conversation with you or two conversations or three conversations. Okay, we, we offer that service as well. Uh, career advice, for those of you that genuinely, I just can't do this anymore. It can be, that can be the most horrendous, horrible feeling in the world when you're at that point. So we, we talk to people about what they can do next because actually you do have these great skills and this great experience and it is wanted and desired by others. Uh, friendly supportive network. So alongside all of the stuff that I've described, there's lots of other stuff going on. We'll buddy you up with another head teacher so you can have a real peer to peer relationship with somebody elsewhere who shares your values. The LA support stuff we do charge for because we do what we do nationally, but we do it specifically for local authorities. And this is a shout out. We're now working with, we're actively working at the moment with 13 local authorities. We're in conversation with about another 20. If you are a leader listening to this, you're thinking, actually, do you know what? I'd really like my local authority or my council to do something about that. Please get in touch um, because actually the more we can spread this message. And we're, the LA work is interesting because although we do charge for it, we're interested in sustainable, impactful work. So we, we come in and we, prime, we pump prime it with the local authority, but we leave something behind. So we leave a heads up network behind that can sustain itself. First one we ever did was in Oxfordshire and it's still going 14 months later. Um, and it, they, they don't have to pay anything. So it's just head teachers supporting head teachers. So that's community support. The sort of uh, campaigning bit of it, I suppose, is it falls under this category events and training. So we have Hope's Red events, which we run with Big Change. 
um, where basically, because we do want to be, you know, we want leaders to have a voice and a say in what's happening in education. So, you know, we talk about actually what's education going to be like in seven years' time or eight years' time or nine years' time. We have a book club. Uh, we're doing our first boot camp ed in the Brecon Beacons in a week and a half's time. We've got 17 head teachers we're taking away. Um, and we also do bits of CPD work. Um, coaching packages, if you're interested, you know, the coaching is, our, is absolutely the core of what we do. We can do one to one coaching, group coaching, resilient leaders coaching. It's all about intentional well being, drop in coaching sessions, and core coaching. So if you're interested in coaching, coaching packages for yourself or for your team, then please do get in touch. Uh, and we offer all of that. This is this is the bit for me. You know, so we're working with sort of it's almost fifteen hundred head teachers at the moment, and it's a hundred percent of the head teachers that we work with recommend our program to another head. Um, that's the peer support stuff, and that you know I can't. We don't really deal in metrics, and actually fundamentally, we 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 deliberately avoid working in metrics because we say if we if we've helped one head teacher on any day, we've done our job, we've done what we set out to do. But people want to know about metrics. One hundred percent of people would say that they have felt better about themselves as a human being and a head teacher because they've joined our peer support work. Uh, and, and I can't get better validation than that. And there's a couple of quotes there from individuals. We've got hundreds of them. Um, just to close up, please do, if, you're, if you are a head teacher or a leader, um, you know, you've liked what you've heard and it's resonated with you to come and join our network, that's number one. Um, Lee and I have had conversations about the possibility of a sort of CF net sort of network of a heads up, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to help CFNet set one up. If you wanted to set one up, that would be, um, that'd be an absolute pleasure to come and join with that. And we're just launching, we've got several, actually it's more than several now, it's nearly 20 trusts have come to us and said, can you do a version of what you do with local authorities? Can you do it in our trust? So if you, if you are working in a trust or a leader in a trust and, and you'd be interested in our map pilot, then please do get in touch. Uh, we're hoping to launch our map pilot in the summer term um, just to see if we can do another version of what we do. And all of it is about can we help head teachers to focus on the joy of their job and the brilliance of their job and the brilliance of the work that they do. Um, and that for me is best summed up by this Maya Angelou quote, um, which is, you know, we should never forget how we make leaders feel in our system. And I suppose that's really at the heart of what we do. Okay, we should have leaders who are leaving at the end of a brilliant career feeling that they have achieved their purpose and their ikigai and they've done a great job and they've handed it over to the next person in the chain and they should be able to do that with a smile on their face. And that's what we do at Heads Up Head Teachers. Thank you for listening. Thank you uh, for presenting that and, and being so open and honest as you did it, James, as well. That's one of the things that I most enjoy when you're presenting it, it that you you do not hide from your own experiences and the challenges you've had and you are you address the importance of vulnerability and I suppose you know it's very true that heads are often alone the buck stops with them you do have to pretend that you're you can tough it out and that's very hard we've got um Chris Upton who's just just joined us has has himself had his own experience with the loss of one of his uh, pupils at the Manchester Arena bombing four years ago. That experience of headship in crisis, um, he had to get through that. And, you know, and I think Chris would be prepared to say that, you know, for him, that experience was in part about knowing your own vulnerabilities. And so it's really useful to hear that message. I just, a couple of things I wanted to quickly say in relationship to it. You were talking about inspiration, the inspirational teacher. I, I'm like you. I fell into education accidentally. You know, I, I, I had a full grant for my PGC at Goldsmiths College in London, and uh, I didn't take it for the first three weeks because I didn't know whether teaching was for me. So, um, and then eventually, I had the experience that you had in a school and thought, yeah, I need to do this. Um, and I was inspired, I suppose, by Mrs. Fisher, my English teacher, who wore red stilettos every day um, and saw me, you know, she recognized me as, as not that council estate oik, but someone who was good with books. Um, and that was transformational for me. I'm wondering whether that's harder now in our culture, that it's harder to have those inspirational teachers now. I'm not sure, you know, that we know that we don't have um, uh, those opportunities to study like your biology teacher took you to a house to do. And there's probably very good reasons why we don't have that. But but those safeguarding 
processes that we have in place for all the right reasons means that relationships between pupils and teachers are different, aren't they, in the past two decades to what they have been for some time? Yeah, I think I mean I think it's a really good point there. I suppose I suppose part of me would say that I think therefore that as the leaders in the system, we're the guardians of that. So actually, how do we how do we make sure that we are helping our staff and our young people to have those moments, it, albeit in a different framework because we live in a different age. But but you know, for me, when people sort of when I get asked, you know, what what is education? One of the big questions I don't think we talk about enough is what's education for. You know, what, what is it about? The, the, the DfE presents a model, we all know what that is. You know, their logic model for education is really straightforward. Okay, get better outcomes for young people so that mm -hmm. we can climb up the pizza league tables. Yeah. You know, that, that's, that's essentially it. That's the, that's, the, that's the policy under which we're all laboring for that and we have done for the last 12 years. But we all know, and we found this during the beginning of the pandemic, right? Education's got so much more going on than that. And actually as leaders, I think it is our job to make sure that we help young people and staff to recognize that so you know the, and that's where it becomes important not just for ourselves to focus on the inspirational moments but for for our staff you mm -hmm. know and for our young people actually what was the thing that did, what made you smile today you know we do that inspirational moments question it's really interesting you get a group of head teachers turn up on the screen like this that i'm looking at now they're all sort of invariably sort of slightly tired and it's been a hard day you know because it's wednesday evening right it's like it's like eight o'clock in the evening Hopefully they've got a glass or something in their hands that they really like. They're all like this. And we say, right, I want you to think over the last three days, just think of an inspirational moment. Just think of one thing that was a reflection. And the screen lights up because everybody starts to smile. Mm -hmm. Because when you think of an inspirational moment, you smile. Mm -hmm. Of course you do, because it reconnects you with your purpose. So, uh, so the point in answer to your question, I think it is harder but that's why it's even more important as leaders that we're creating the right culture in which those things can be appreciated. But actually for our young people and for our teachers, they're not letting, because it's happening all around us all the time. This is the bizarre thing. This is the irony. You know, we, we, if you're in a class of 30 children, you cannot fail over the course of a day to be in a class with 30 young people and not see something inspiring happen. It is an impossibility. And yet, because we're all so focused on the improvement agenda and the 15% of what's not working, we're missing them. So we have to create a space where people are looking for them. Yeah, God, that was great. Yes, that's why I became a teacher. You know, so we're reminding ourselves of these moments all of the time. But I, I agree with you. I think it can be harder, but it therefore makes our role as leaders in making sure that we're doing it for ourselves, but we're also doing it for the children. Yeah, and, and interestingly, and, and Davis, put a comment for you in the chat and I I haven't been to many schools in this role but I've been to Anne's school and Anne is one of those leaders who seems to bring joy around the school by her presence yeah. she has that gift I hope she doesn't mind me saying that um even when she's just bossing people about in the dinner queue it's the yeah, way exactly. she does it you know yeah yeah um, and of course, we do, the, 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 this is the difficult thing right because no it's very rare somebody runs up to you and go oh my god you were so inspiring it just doesn't happen, right? Yeah. So, so which is why it's important we're looking for it. And because we do, I mean, I've, I've God, it looks like there's loads of really experienced leaders on this call. Mm -hmm. Now, how many times have we had that situation where a member of staff has moved on from our organization and they've come up to us and said, thank you. Three years ago, you said something to me and that's made me want to go off and do the job that I'm now going to do. And of course, in the moment when you said that thing, nobody recognized it to be the inspirational mm -hmm. moment it was, but it was. Mm. And three years later, that person comes up to you and says, I'm going to go off and be a maths leader now because you said that thing to me. Yeah. And it's that, that's education, right? That's what education is. Yeah. So when we ask the question, what is education for? For me, that's what it's for. Yeah. And Anne, HJ, you have your hand up. Yeah. Hi, thanks, James. Thank you. Um, you have brought a smile to my face at many points during that presentation. And I've been in this job for an extremely long time in fact i've been a head teacher for 27 years wow. you wouldn't tell it from my youthful demeanor would you but hence um, my way and one of the things that i have learned to do is every day when we have our staff debrief is to finish the day by asking people what nice things had happened yeah. so although the debrief fundamentally is to try and make sure that we have addressed whatever issue of concern that has come up so everybody knows that there is a plan for the following morning. 
it actually means that at, at the end of every day, people walk away sometimes laughing out loud because of a situation that's happened, but definitely with the smile on, our, on their faces. And I think that's something that isn't difficult to do, to, to share with colleague head teachers of when you do this at the end of your staff meeting, whether it's weekly or in my case daily, ask that question, just as you have done in your training, you know, what, what's it made you be inspired? What lovely thing has happened in the last three days? So thank you. You've been um, an absolute joy to listen to today. Oh, thank Much you, appreciated. Thank you very much.